Before I get started, uh, I think anytime we start events, we should always acknowledge the people's land that we're on. Uh, so we're on indigenous Duwamish land, right? That was stolen from them. Um, and so we want to acknowledge and um, throw some respect to them, right? Um, so yeah, so I, I'm really thankful for, for y'all having me out here. I know a lot of y'all <laughs> um, from UW, for those of you who um, I haven't gotten a chance to meet yet, um, I'm really excited for y'all to be here. And I'm gonna share just a little bit um, about my own kind of research interests uh, and my own work uh, as a scholar, as a student in African diaspora studies. Um, so I'm gonna try to talk as little as possible, actually. So I'm gonna give about a 20, 30 minute presentation, try to keep it on the lower end of that. Uh, and then we'll just have some more discussions because I want us to be kind of in communication uh, and in dialogue with each other. Um, I come from a background of ethnic studies um, and one of the kind of core beliefs in our field is that academics and scholars do not hold the knowledge, really the knowledge comes from the community. So I wanna also acknowledge um, the knowledge that you all bring here too, right? Um, and in that regard, I'm no expert, I'm just maybe somebody who studied a little bit. Again, uh, we have our title here, Dynamics of the Diaspora. My name is Brew Cobb Seaside. I teach at the American Ethnic Studies Department uh, at the UW Seattle. I'm a visiting lecturer there. Uh, and I put my email here just in case folks wanna keep in touch. Um, uh, so please feel free to reach out afterwards. Um, so I wanna share just a little bit before I get started. I think it's always useful to hear about who you're hearing from, right? And what is my background and kind of entrance into this work. Uh, so I myself was born in Ethiopia, uh, in the capital city, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Um, this is actually the hospital <laughs> I was born at, Zodi II Hospital, uh, named after one of the uh, empresses of Ethiopia. Um, so I was born there, uh, and at about three years old, I left to London. My mother um, had a stroke, and they weren't able to treat her there, and then she was able to get uh, a group to sponsor her to go there. Um, we would have never left Ethiopia if it were not for that, that incident, right? Um, and I connect that to kind of longer histories about, you know, people don't migrate without necessity, right? And especially right now in our political moment, there's this demonization of migrants. Um, but we have to remember, people don't leave their homelands, their ancestry, their cultures for no reason. Um, in that regard, we left because of that, that medical reason. And we ended up in London, England, uh, where we lived for about four years. Uh, my mom, my dad, my brother, and I. Clearly, I was not very happy <laughs> to be in, in England. Um, I lived there about, for about four years, and then I came here to Seattle, Washington. Actually, Angle Lake uh, was the place that I first moved to in 1997. Um, and I've been here since. Um, and I think like many of the folks in this room, for those of us who grew up being from another place, right, there's always this sense of conflict around our identities, right, and trying to understand who we are, how do we fit into this space. Uh, and that was always a kind of tense thing. And especially growing up, the narrative, especially about Ethiopia, was not a positive one, right? Um, and growing up, it was something that I actually was ashamed of. Um, because oftentimes, the images that I saw of Ethiopia were not positive ones, right? And it, it caused this kind of disassociation. I remember this, this um, book I saw in the library. It was like a world fact book, right? Uh, and it showed all these kinds of things from all these places around the world. And it had this one page in particular that shows toilets of the world, right? And you can see Kuwait in the nice, um, you know, marble seats, the toilet seats, right? Thailand, Japan, uh, for Ethiopia, right? It just showed the tree, right? Um, these images were really painful. Right? Uh, and these narratives were really in our minds. So eventually, um, in 2006, after I graduated high school, I enrolled at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, where I did my undergraduate. Um, and it was there that I started having these really kind of interesting conversations around race, around blackness, um, that kind of sparked my own journey into graduate school and into what I'm doing now. Um, in particular, there were a couple meetings, and it's ironic, uh, two weeks ago there was this similar meeting that, that the Black Student Union, the African Student Association, a lot of the black organizations on campus held. Um, so this was the one that we had back when I was an undergraduate. Um, it was this dialogue around who we are as a diaspora, who we are as black people, do we get along with each other, where are our conflicts, uh, and how do we mobilize? Um, and it really left an impression on, on, on me, right? And I tried to afterwards think a lot about that in relation to my own community uh, and in relation to our diaspora. Um, and one of the interesting things is that, you know, despite our own kind of differences around how we identify, if you look at the census to this day, right, we're grouped as one category, right? Um, it says black, African-American, or Negro. Um, the irony of this, right, so if you look underneath, and this is actually from the census, right, so you have categories for Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, even like very specific Chamorro, very specific ethnicities, right, but the entire continent of Africa is subsumed, right, under this kind of just category of blackness. Um, so despite the kind of tensions and differences in how we identify from people outside of our community, we are grouped as one, right? Um, and kind of, I think, reveals how race operates, <laughs> right? How blackness operates, uh, at least in an American context. 
Um, so yeah, so at the UW, I ended up doing actually an uh, undergraduate research project looking at um, universities' practices around this and how they were kind of misrepresenting um, how they were doing in relation to recruiting, graduating black students by hiding under this kind of um, facade that they were doing a lot, but in, in reality, they were actually admitting a lot more immigrants, black immigrants, who just across the board do well in school, right? Um, so they were claiming that victory as part of their institutional efforts to address structural racism, when in reality, it was just more a, a the context of who was coming in, right? Um, so anyway, it revealed some of those fissures, and, and now my own work really focuses on higher education. I won't be talking so much about that today, um, just more broadly about the diaspora, but that's some of my own research interests. Um, so I ended up, after I graduated at UW in 2011, I went to the University of California at Berkeley, um, where I am enrolled in what's called the African Diaspora Studies graduate program, uh, doctoral program. Um, so it's not the only one of its kind, and right now we're seeing a lot more departments that formerly were African American studies now moving towards this frame of diaspora. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is and what the implications of that are. Um, but really, the main effort in doing that is to be a lot more inclusive, right? And to kind of open up how we think about blackness, how we think about race beyond just the United States framework, right? Um, what we know is black people are in <laughs> around the world entirely, right? Blackness operates globally, um, and so we shouldn't just center the U.S. kind of um, experience of that. Uh, in that regard, and I think in relation to Africa now and some of the work that folks in this room are doing, um, also thinking about what are the relationships between black people here and black people abroad, right? Um, and making some of those connections. Uh, so if we were to actually define what African diaspora studies as a field attempts to do, um, this would be, I think, a, a useful start, right? So we can think of African diaspora studies as a theoretical framework that enables a mode of studying and conceptualizing black people globally, right? So again, expanding our, our analysis to the global scale uh, and thinking about how blackness operates there. Within that, what are some things that people consider, right? Um, so we think about these kind of larger processes of movement, of migration, uh, of exile, of ways of colonialism, imperialism, other factors have played into that, right? Um, we often center enslavement and slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, as the definitive kind of narrative of the African diaspora, right? But what we know, and I'll get into a little bit later, is there's actually a lot of other routes, right, that people have kind of migrated around the world. Uh, so we attempt to, to engage with that a bit. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, thinking about what are the connections between our communities, right? So folks in my field, um, a lot of folks study culture, popular culture. Um, a lot of folks study literature, right, and think about how literature migrates. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Chimamanda Adichie, um, her novel Americana, right, as a transnational novel. The protagonist is a Nigerian immigrant to America who like travels back and forth, goes to England. Um, so stories like that, right, including that alongside the kind of canon of African American literature, right, and thinking about the relationships between those. Um, so yeah, so a lot of folks are in the humanities. I'm more on the social science side, so I look more at education, uh, kind of a sociological aspect. Um, but yeah, the, the field is really diverse and, and growing. Um, so I just want to share briefly some of the texts that um, I really love and I think are really useful in thinking about the diversity, feel free to take pictures, y'all, <laughs> the diversity of um, really the black diaspora, right, and some of our stories and how we can account for, so for some of these differences. Um, so for example, in the top left corner, black identities, West Indian immigrant dreams and American realities. Next to it, problematizing blackness, self-ethnographies of black immigrants in the United States. So both of these look at um, Caribbean, black Caribbean communities in the US. Um, the Other African Americans, which looks at African immigrants in the U.S., Ethiopian immigrants and refugees in America. Um, this book is actually really incredible because it's about the Northwest. It's called Seeking Salam. Uh, the subtitle is Ethiopian Eritreans and Somalis in the Pacific Northwest. So it's actually an ethnography of our communities here, uh, which is really dope to see kind of yourself reflected, right, uh, and your stories told in that. Um, books that kind of engage with how black people mobilized politically, right? So this assumption that maybe newer black immigrants may not politically mobilize in the ways that we traditionally understand black communities too, right? And this book looks at some of the kind of differences in how black people identify politically in that regard. Uh, black Ethnics does a similar project, and then we have more um, theoretical, uh, theoretical analyses of the diaspora. Global Circuits of Blackness is a kind of a broader ranging, uh, looks at not just one particular community, but, but the larger African diaspora and does some theoretical work behind that. Uh, and then finally, African and American, West Africans in post-civil rights America, right, which centers on West African 
uh, immigrants and, and a lot of their identity, community mobilizations, and so on. Uh, okay, so yeah, so we have a growing field now that is looking at this, thinking about these questions. Uh, and if we were to think about, uh, and I, wa I want to share a quick quote from what, uh, a writer that I think is really useful in thinking about what the project of diaspora should be. Okay, so I'm going to just read this out loud. I want different bounds. I want a broad and inclusive blackness that generationally improves, continuously mobilizes against injustice, and supports community without stripping black people of individuality, culture, or lived experiences. I want South Carolina black, and Senegal black, and Cuba black, and Arizona black, and Australia black. I want more, more buoyancy than binaries, right? Really, so again, expanding our, our de definition of who black people are, of who the African diaspora are, to include the kind of full range of our complexities, right? Um, so yeah, so I think that's a, a real big project of mine, <laughs> right? Is to kind of expand African American studies, expand African diaspora studies to include our narratives. Um, and you don't have to actually look very far. So if you actually look to just like black American history, one of the things that we realize is black immigrants, uh, black African immigrants, Caribbean immigrants have always been central to the black freedom struggle, right? So if we, let me, let me get some feedback here from y'all, right? Do we know who that is on the top left? Marcus Garvey, right? So he's uh, from Jamaica, uh, the leader of the largest, to this date, the largest mobilization of black people in the world, the United Negro Improvement Association. To this day, we have not seen what he was able to achieve as far as mobilizing people. Um, he even tried to mobilize people to move back to Africa, right? Saying that we're never gonna get the respect and rights that we deserve here in this country. Let's go back and build our own. Um, and so he's a, a really big Pan-Africanist figure. Uh, does anybody know who that is next to her? The first woman to run for president in this country before? Shirley Chisholm. Yeah, Shirley Chisholm, right? <laughs> yeah, no, right on. Um, yeah, so Shirley Chisholm, who's also from the Caribbean, from uh, Barbados, and her father's from British Guiana in particular. Um, next to him, does anybody know who that is? Stoke, yeah, Stokely Carmichael, right? Um, the inventor of the concept of black power, a, a central figure that inspired the Black Panthers, a lot of black nationalist organizations. Uh, he himself is also a Caribbean immigrant. Um, or child of Caribbean immigrants. Of course, you know Malcolm X, <laughs> right? Um, Harry Belafonte uh, at the bottom, Rihanna, right, <laughs> from Barbados. Uh, Barry O, right, Barack Obama. <laughs> I love that picture, right? Like, I, that's the picture that should be hanging up somewhere, right? Because um, that's his family, right? And, and to think about him as the, the child of a Kenyan uh, immigrant, right, a Kenyan um, student who came here and became the first black president of this country, right? Um, and in many ways, right, even the way that we kind of think about Barack Obama and he, how, how he's narrated as a black person without really, you know, thinking about, I mean, he's mixed race <laughs> on top of that, right, without thinking about him being Kenyan, um, but how he's homogenized as black, right? So certain people get that, <laughs> that kind of um, space and other folks do not uh, without much analysis. Does anybody know who this is? What's her name? Ilhan Omar. Omar, right? So Congresswoman uh, out of Minnesota, uh, who's uh, Somali American, right? Um, so again, thinking about how these folks have always been from the past to the present, a part of black American history, right? And I think is, that's a central part of this project, right? Is asserting um, our space in this too. Because I think for a lot of us who grew up here feeling like maybe that's not our lane, right? Maybe that's not our, our um, history. That's, that's not at all the case. Um, and we can also actually think back to the fact that black immigrants were also victimized by Jim Crow um, were also victimized by structural racism, right, and have always been a part of that struggle in that regard, too. Um, okay, yeah, so again, we can think of some of these figures as illustrating this, this very um, point. Uh, and if we look back to the history, the critical context, right, of black people in the diaspora, we can name multiple sites, right, in which, or what we refer to in African diaspora studies, multiple routes, right, in which black folks have um, become a part of the diaspora. So we center the transatlantic slave trade, um, a lot of these refer, these middle ones refer to kind of internal migrations within the United States. Um, but we also know actually as early as 1791, Haitians were migrating to the United States of America, right? So this is still, oh, oh my gosh, so 70 years before the end of enslavement in the United States of America, right? Haitians were coming to the United States. Um, there are actually even stories of African immigrants coming to the United States during that time, right? And if anybody's familiar with 12 Years a Slave, um, which depicts the kind of truth of what would happen. So free black people would often be captured and, and sold into enslavement. Um, this would often happen to those migrants as well, right? Um, I actually hear these stories in, in some of these old ethnographies of like Ethiopians who ended up in uh, Georgia 
right, and, and intermarried, had children with, with black Americans, and these kind of oral stories that were passed down, right. I had a great great grandmother whose name was Almas, whose name was, uh, you know, this, this very like Ethiopian Habesha name, right, and these kind of traditions that were passed down. Um, so needless to say, right, this is our history too. Um, so in relation to my own work, Ethiopian American studies, uh, I mentioned that that kind of um, these stories I would hear, right, about black uh, Ethiopian multiple generations back being in the South. Um, one of the things that I came across in my research is this image, um, which is actually taken in Ellis Island, New York, right, which is a processing center for immigrants in the United States of America. And this picture was taken in 1902. So it says 1800s in there, that's actually wrong. So it was taken in 1902, right? Um, so again, when we could think about what is the role of black immigrants in the black freedom struggle, right? Well, one of the things we know is in the United States of America, folks have been here, right? Uh, and folks have been a part of this struggle. Uh, so in many ways, this is our history, right? This is our struggle as well. So as I mentioned uh, just a bit ago, right? So one of the biggest waves of migrants that we've seen recently um, has come from Africa. Uh, so pulling from this quote from one of those texts I mentioned earlier, African and American, West Africans in the post-civil rights America, the author writes, in the past four decades, more Africans have come to the United States of their own volition than were forcibly brought in bondage to the shores of the Americas during the more than three centuries of international commerce and human slavery subsequent to European contact. So in the last four years, more African immigrants have come here than the, the full number of African, uh, Africans who were enslaved during the transatlantic slave trade, right? So just to think about how we need to expand our concept, it's not just a theoretical project, it's a reality of our communities here. Um, we see that at the University of Washington, we see that in our communities here, right? We see a lot of black folks who don't fit that uh, middle passage um, narrative as in regards to, to their own experiences. Uh, so just to share a little, uh, some data about this, right? So if we look at, um, some of this pure research data in regards to who these immigrants are, where they come from. Uh, let's, let's look at this on the left-hand side at first. So, so looking at the, the figures here, so 2006 and later, Africans, right, so 36% of migrants uh, are coming in in this later period, right? So we see, again, the vast majority of African immigrants coming in the post-2006 in more kind of more recent periods. Um, uh, and then similar, similarly that data point, right, about African immigrants. So we're seeing, it's not, not only is it in the last four decades, we're actually seeing it ramp up uh, in the last couple of years, right? So of 2015, by far exceeding, more than doubling uh, the numbers that came in, in the 2000s. Um, yeah, so again, I think this work is necessitated by the fact that these are our black communities here, right? These are the folks who, because that census data, because the way in which you think about blackness, right, these are black folks who are here, uh, and we need to kind of engage with their histories, uh, and that's part of one of my, one of my projects. Um, looking at African immigrants specifically, so just to kind of disaggregate that a little bit more, who are the African immigrants who are coming here? Um, the vast majority are coming from Nigeria, which is also um, the most populous nation in Africa too, so maybe not a, a huge surprise there. Um, but yeah, so the vast majority of African immigrants come from Nigeria, second to that, Ethiopia, third, Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, uh, and so on there, right? So you can see going down the list. Um, so maybe not a surprise, right? Because we know in our own communities, maybe that's the, those are the folks who are there, right? Um, who we see around us. Okay, and then uh, beyond that, right? Where are people actually immigrating to within the United States of America, right? So here in Seattle, it may not be a surprise. We have a lot of East African uh, migrants who come here, right? So if we look at from Eastern Africa, uh, the vast majority end up in California, uh, Minnesota, so a lot of our Somali communities, right, um, end up up there, so that's why there's a big kind of spike there. Uh, and then the Northwest as well, too, right, so where we are. Um, and then we can see folks from West Africa kind of end up on the East Coast, uh, also in California, it looks like, yeah, in the South as well. From Southern Africa, mostly in California, uh, and then next to that, Florida, and it looks like, let's see, Texas as well. Uh, and then most from Central Africa are actually ending up in um, near the nation's capital, right? Um, so this may not be a surprise to folks who are from these communities, right? You go to particular parts of this country and you see a lot more folks from a particular area, right? Um, and this matters because when you look in those specific areas, the ways in which people identify, the ways in which people politically mobilize is really impacted by those national communities, right? Um, there's a little joke for, for us uh, Ethiopians, right? When we go to DC, it feels like you haven't left Ethiopia, right? Because <laughs> you land in the airport and everyone <laughs> looks Ethiopian. You, I mean, you get out and like some street signs are actually written in Amarinya, 
um, the main language in Ethiopia. Um, and people stay really close together because they can, because there's just so many people. Similarly, in Minnesota, there are pockets like that for Somali communities, right, which are useful for immigrants. You can kind of stay in your area. You can um, get resources you need in the language that you know and whatnot. Um, but that would look different if you end up somewhere in the cuts, right? For whoever ends up in North Dakota, right? <laughs> Jesus, like someone be with them, please, because that's going to be a struggle, right? So, I mean, and it's, in that regard, it's not a surprise, right? People are going to end up where they can kind of get support. Um, so, yeah, so let's, so breaking that down a little bit, we can see that through these, these graphs. Um, and then finally, looking at the Caribbean, um, where folks are coming, right? This is often an absence in, in how we think about immigrants, right? Caribbean immigrants also are a part of the Middle Passage. These are folks who are also enslaved um, in varying degrees, not just enslaved, but were also colonized, right? We can think about the presence of um, European colonizers. Jamaica was a, a British colony, for example, right? Um, and would also have been shaped by that reality as well. Okay, yeah, so these are, these are our black communities, right? These are our black immigrant communities um, who are here. Um, I want to plug really quickly this, this documentary. Um, so I show this in my 101 class, my Introduction to African American Studies class, called the Neo-African Americans. Um, I recommend if folks just want to like, learn a little bit about the identities of some of these folks, um, it's a great way to engage with that. Um, what it does is it collects all these different kind of black folks and it asks them this question, how do you identify? Um, and where we would think a lot of folks from the outside, outside of our communities would say, well, that's a black person, right? Um, what they actually reveal is they have all these different ways of self-identifying. Right? So um, African-American, African, non-American, African and American, double African American, a true African American, Afro Latinx American, West Indian African American, right? So um, they come up with actually 21 different types of identities, right? So within blackness, what we see is there's so much heterogeneity, so much difference, right? Um, and people are identifying based on their religion, based on their ethnicity, nationality, right? Uh, maybe before just this superseding category of, of being black. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of, again, the work of African diaspora studies is to break this apart. We are often homogenized because of the one drop rule in this country, because of the ways in which blackness is seen as just this, this blob, this homogenous blob, right? Um, but what we, I think most of us in this folks know as, as, as black folks, right, is there's so much diversity um, within that. And that's one of the things I try to teach my, my students too. Um, okay, so, so beyond just the kind of the questions around identity, um, I think the, the central thing is, what are the actual issues in our communities, right? Um, and beyond that, what are ways in which these issues may overlap? Uh, so what I want to do at first is talk about some of the issues um, in black immigrant communities, right? For those of y'all who are from these, these may not be, um, these, might, these, these might be really familiar, right? These might be things that you also have, have seen and experienced. Um, but for folks outside of it, they may not, they may not see some of these. Um, okay, so centrally, the, the big thing is invisibility right, is the ways in which we categorize race in this country, right, does not allow for disaggregation, does not allow for a really deeper engagement with the specifics of who our communities are. Uh, as a researcher, this becomes really challenging, right? <laughs> so when I try to look up data uh, on this, it's really hard because they only say black, right? But then that there's not really a breakdown of who those communities are. We're just homogenized uh, as one. So in data collection, we see that uh, and a lot of our historical record in academia, um, this is really a, a big problem, right? Issues around invisibility. Um, I will tell you all, so I actually, when I graduated in 2011 from the University of Washington, I actually studied the department I'm teaching in. Uh, I studied African American studies, right? And in my entire four years, there was never a single class, even within a class, an engagement with black immigrants, right? As a part of African American studies or African American history. So. Um, it seems kind of sad in 2019, we're now just getting to, to kind of seeing that reflected here at one of our kind of elite institutions here, right? Um, so anyway, we, we got to kind of push and, and, and try to challenge this invisibility. Um, to the point from the last slide, right, very clearly, there are really, com really complex identities here. Um, we cannot just homogenize and assume the ways in which people identify, right? And it becomes sometimes really infuriating uh, I had this reaction when I would see a lot of kind of like black folks mobilizing around police brutality and sometimes not seeing my own community in those spaces, right? Uh, for so long, I would think like, why are, d d do they not see themselves as black? Do they not see the struggle as part of their struggle? Uh, and it took some time for me to realize um, maybe that that's not the most 
central thing as far as their own identity, right? Uh, maybe their religion is really the, the most important thing in regards to who, how they see themselves and how they interact in this world, right? Maybe it's their ethnicity. Uh, maybe it's their gender, right? Other things may be more central than race, um, even though for those of us who lived here for a long time, race really becomes the most central thing, right, in regards to how we interact with, with uh, institutions and the state. Um, but then there is this kind, kind of critique of that, right? So regardless of how we self-identify, we are still identified by outsiders as black, right? There are countless stories of black immigrants also being victimized by police brutality, also being victimized by um, the criminal injustice system, right? All these other kinds of areas in which our issues do overlap. So despite how we may self-identify, we also have to think about how are we identified by the state, right? Uh, for, for example. Um, as I mentioned earlier, right, the mode of entry, the way in which black immigrants come to this country also shapes the way in which they identify. Uh, to give a specific example of that, we can think about if folks came here via the brain drain, right, so maybe folks who were already elites in their homeland, right, who were already educated, who had wealth, um, who come here might think of themselves politically different as folks who come here uh, as economic refugees, um, as people fleeing civil wars, right, as people fleeing strife. Uh, and that might also shape their identities, right? So these are kind of just breaking apart why, are, why these identities might be complex. Um, this point about transnationalism as well, right? So to, to go back to that point earlier about why, why some black immigrants may not be as like politically thinking of themselves as black and mobilizing. Uh, the other thing is a lot of our communities don't even think of themselves as staying permanently in this country, right? They are thinking of, of themselves as moving back home, right? They're often supporting people back home they are already mobilizing and living their lives as transnational people, right? Um, I know a lot of folks in my own community really don't want to get citizenship here, right? They think of themselves as, um, I'm only here for the time being, and then maybe they have kids, and then they start to reconsider, right? Um, but they're already like building property back home, right? They're sending money back home. They're already thinking, I'm going to go back uh, and really identify more as a transnational person, uh, maybe more so than black American in, in our context here. Um, okay, and then finally, regional context matters, right? So uh, where you end up, right, and the kinds of politics you see around you are going to shape your identity very clearly, right? Um, so that would also shape the way in which we need to engage with how black immigrants may identify uh, and how we also build solidarities uh, in that regard. Okay, and then, um, so I'm just going to show you all these and then talk about them more as a, as a whole. Uh, so in regards to ways in which the experiences of black immigrants intersect with just the experiences of immigrants in this country, right? Um, so we see this absence in a lot of our thinking about black politics, right? We don't think about like undocumented black people, for example, right? Um, we don't think about the fact that we have a lot of black immigrants who are DACA recipients, right? Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, which this current administration is threatening, right? Um, this program called the TPS uh, immigration program. So a lot of like Haitians, for example, were able to secure um, visas to come to this country and permanent status here, which are also being threatened, right? So when we think about what are the issues facing black people in this country, right? Um, we also need to be thinking about ways in which immigrants are also experiencing very particular types of uh, struggles, right? And how we need to mobilize. Around that. Um, so black immigrants, right, would experience some of these intersections in regards to what immigrants as a whole uh, experience in this country. So downplaying of racism, um, again, it's transnational, right, thinking about relocating or repatriating back to their homelands, issues around language barriers, right, cultural barriers that these immigrants might face, um, the very real reality that a lot of our community's families are divided, right. Um, I mean, it's a really tragic thing when you think about a lot of these immigrants are coming here, right, you know, sending money back home, but in the inside are actually like really broken, right? Are away from their culture, are away from their families. Uh, and then in a lot of ways that, that's gonna shape their experience here too, right? Uh, so we need to kind of be understanding uh, of that. Um, there's a group actually right now um, in relation to my own community, the Ethiopian uh, community, the Habesha community more broadly, there's a group called the Habesha Dream Campaign, um, which are trying to think about um, these issues around struggles around immigration for this community in particular, right, and are mobilizing resources to hire lawyers, to hire support for um, a lot of folks who are actually even to this day incarcerated. We have children who are incarcerated in those, in those um, child camps in the southern border, right? We have a lot of Af African immigrants who try to come to this country through South and Central America, 
Um, and so this group, uh, among others, are trying to mobilize and think about this community, right, which are often left out of the dominant narratives around who immigrants are as like South and Central American people, right? Um, so yeah, so we can think about this as maybe one example of uh, how we engage with the specific needs of black immigrants in this country too, right? Um, I think we all know as black folks, a lot of black folks in this room, right, that there are tensions clearly, right, within our communities. Um, but beyond that, what are ways in which people are actually engaging um, with that? And I have on, on the sides here some organizations that do this type of work, right? So here locally, um, the Africa Town, right? So in the CD, trying to preserve the history of the black community that, I mean, in the 1970s um, was a big community, right? At the, as far as the 1970s, and now is in the single digits, right? Eight, maybe even less, seven, seven percent, right? Uh, black folks in the CD, um, which was the historic black part of this of the city, right? Uh, and Africa Town is not just focused on um, black Americans, but actually is doing a lot of work around African immigrants as well too. So trying to build these gaps, uh, build these bridges uh, together. Uh, there's a group called African Women's Business Alliance, and I know the founder is actually going to be a speaker at the Africa Now conference. So for those of y'all who will make it there, you'll get a chance to, to hear from her. Um, so this is a local nonprofit. It started about two years ago, and they support uh, black and African women who have small businesses, right? And so looking at the fact that um, we experience similar levels of economic inequality, right, and want to support our businesses, but with this way that is also engaged with African immigrants, Caribbean immigrants, uh, black American multi-generational folks as well. In, in, in continuing with this point around um, mobilizations within our communities, um, you know, one of the things I always try to center is the fact that um, and it's great to see these things are still happening, but we actually can look to history and see that these things have always been happening, right? And we can build off of um, mobilizations that have happened before, right? So when we think about um, some of the areas in which our communities' experiences overlap and intersect, right? We can think about shared oppressions in regards to uh, anti-blackness, right? We know anti-blackness is a global phenomenon, right? White supremacy is a global phenomenon. We know that black people, I don't know if anybody, uh, Andre 3000, half an outcast, right? There's this famous picture, he's wearing a shirt where he says, you know, why are black people in every culture um, treated the worst? Or something to that regard, right? We know that. Everywhere in the world, black people are always treated the worst, right? Um, we see anti-blackness manifest all across the globe. Um, we can think about that as a site of shared struggle. Uh, sh experiences of segregation, colonialism, police brutality, poverty, uh, income inequality, immigration justice, uh, to give some more examples. Um, we can think about um, also, and what we're seeing is people have actually moved back, right? Um, Marcus Garvey's Back to Africa movement, Rastafarianism is another movement, right? People have actually moved back to Africa. Um, even to this day, we're seeing now with um, these kinds of new forms of DNA testing, right? Where folks can actually find out what part of Africa their ancestry comes from. Um, to give an example, Isaiah Washington, he was an actor who was on Grey's Anatomy. Um, as a, he got fired for some <laughs> homophobic stuff, he said problematic. Um, but nonetheless, he ended up getting like Senegalese citizenship, right? Do, doing a DNA test to find out where his ancestors came from and has now actually gotten citizenship and has kind of made that um, reverse um, effort to, to connect back home, right? Um, okay, and then finally, I think one of the other things that necessitates us moving together and working together is the fact that actually when, when you look at, and this is where my social science kind of data, my, head, my hat comes on, right? Um, so a lot of black immigrants do well in the first generation, right, uh, in terms of education, in terms of s some, some other aspects of, of our uh, measures of success, right? But what we actually see is when you look at the actual second and third generation black immigrants, our outcomes are nearly identical, right? So when you look at actually experiences in schools, experiences with the criminal justice system, um, our outcomes are identical, right? Meaning that what we're seeing is generationally anti-blackness, especially in this country, right? Structural racism has an effect, right? Um, black immigrants, regardless of where they're from, regardless of if they came through the brain drain, uh, had wealth, class, whatever it may be, our, our issues actually converge by that point, and thus we need to kind of uh, mobilize together. Uh, okay, so I want to just share briefly just because um, in relation to my own community, Ethiopian, uh, the, the Ethiopian diaspora in particular, um, again, because I always kind of grew up with this feeling that to be Ethiopian was not to be American, right, and these ideas about what Ethiopia was uh, in this negative kind of Western characterization of it, um, when I actually begun digging in the history, what I saw was that there's a rich history of black American and Ethiopian solidarities. So I want to just speak briefly uh, about some examples of those. Um, 
So in particular, let's start with the, the image in the top left-hand corner. So this is an image of a church in Harlem in, in New York uh, called Abyssinia Baptist Church. So Abyssinia Baptist Church um, in the civil rights movement had a very kind of central role. A lot of civil rights figures came through that church. Um, Adam Clayton Powell in particular was the minister of that church and was also a very central um, figure in the movement. So that church actually started in 1808. So this is some 60 years before the end of slavery in this country. This church started in New York because of this, and the oral tradition that they have of this is that there were Ethiopians there at that time, uh, and they entered this place of worship with black Americans, and together realized that in, in, under the Christian faith, right, segregation cannot be a thing, or all equal in God's eyes, and thus we need to leave this church, this segregated space, and create our own institution. So they started in 1808, this independent black church called Abyssinia Baptist Church, um, that has this tradition, right, of having black immigrant and, and Af African-American solidarities, right, as, as the root of that. Um, later on, so this is 1808, uh, later on in the early 1900s, right, um, when Italy was trying to colonize Ethiopia for the second time. So after, in 1896, um, the Battle of Adwa took place, which, uh, oh gosh, that's a long story <laughs> that, that I don't want to get too much into, but it was um, one of the moments in which uh, Abyssinia at that time, the empire, stood up to Italy, defended its borders, uh, even though the, the, the side effect of that was that Eritrea became a colony of, of uh, Italy. So that's why I don't think of it as a complete victory. That's why I have a little hesitation about celebrating that entirely. Um, because of the, the consequence for Eritrea. Um, but nonetheless, so later on, Italy tried to come back the second time in the 1930s. Uh, and at that time, there were actually black Americans from the U.S. who tried to go back and fight on behalf of Ethiopia. So there's actually um, two aviators uh, in particular that I want to talk about. Uh, so on the top, uh, in the middle, so you see Haile Selassie, Ethiopia, uh, written on the plane behind him. His name is Herbert Jr. He was referred to as the Black Eagle. Um, so he actually went and led the Ethiopian Air Force in the fight against Italy, right? So he's a black American who went um, at that time to actually fight on behalf of Ethiopia, right? And I always think to this day, like, what would Ethiopians think, right, if they understood the actual sacrifices that black Americans actually undertook to fight for our independence, right? Uh, to then come here with anti-black feelings, right? It seems very contradictory. So there's a, a law in this country that prevents American citizens from fighting on behalf of wars that America is not. Uh, a part of, right? So at that time, yeah, so actually a lot of African Americans, these images at the bottom, there were these huge like uh, registration points in, in Harlem, for example, where African Americans tried to go and sign up to actually fight on behalf of the Ethiopian army, right? Uh, and a lot of them were prevented from doing so. Um, so there's actually this side war where they actually went and fought in Europe against fascism. So they tried to fight Italy on another battlefield um, with the same, you know, trying to fight Italy, but they were prevented from actually going to Africa and fighting on behalf of uh, Ethiopia in particular, yeah. Uh, I'm really curious, actually, and I, I want to learn a little bit more into this history, how they were able to uh, in that context, right? But, yeah, like you said, a lot more folks actually wanted to. Um, and even if they didn't go themselves, they sent money, right? So they actually did support in a whole bunch of other ways. Um, so this kind of, this image up here, um, has anybody heard of Joe Lewis? Yeah, so a, a really important figure in black American. Um, he's a boxer. So there was actually a fight, I think this was in, let's see, the exact, let's say this right, 1935. Um, so there's actually a fight where he fought this guy named Primo Carnara, who was an Italian-American. Uh, and that fight came to embody this broader struggle of Italy against Ethiopia, right? So actually at this fight, a lot of black Americans who were supporting Joe Louis came waving Ethiopian flags. Um, the fight itself was a fundraiser. A lot of people were raising funds to be sent to Ethiopia to support the effort back there. Uh, and when he won, it was seen as a victory for Ethiopia. People were actually ch uh, chanting and, and, and singing about that, right? Um, so that is what this kind of image is, is meant to symbolize. Um, but yeah, but we see this kind of long tradition, right, of black Americans identifying themselves with African struggles, right? And I think this is an important history for us to um, engage with. Uh, so like Herbert, next to the image here, so right here, uh, this is a man named John Robinson, Colonel John Robinson. Uh, he was known as the Brown Condor. He actually was trained at Tuskegee, right? So if, if folks are familiar at all with the Tuskegee Airmen, right, and the history of black uh, fighters and the segregated forces in the U.S. history, right? So he was a part of that legacy. He ended up um, going to Ethiopia. He actually um, married an Ethiopian woman, lived the rest of his life, and, and was buried there. Um, so there were actually, see, again, these migrations of people moving back home, identifying with that struggle, and, and being very supportive uh, even of his life. John Robinson, yeah, Colonel John Robinson. Um, to the left of him uh, is a woman named Minion Ford, um, and she actually traveled to Ethiopia in 1930 and started the first secondary school for girls there. 
right? So a black American woman um, who moved back to, or who moved to Ethiopia and actually created a school there, right? So we see, again, we don't have to look far. In history, there are multiple examples of these types of solidarities um, that we should acknowledge and kind of build off of and longer struggle. Minion, M-I-G-N-O-N, Ford. Yeah, Minion Ford. Yeah, so again, we can think about these historical examples, uh, efforts at building these types of solidarities. Um, but we can also see, in many ways, right, the presence of these solidarities through the present day. Um, in particular, historically black colleges and universities have been a central place of where these, these kinds of um, solidarities have been built. Um, if you look at actually that a lot of the first leaders of African nations after um, independence, a lot of those were educated at places like Howard University, right? Um, we're part of black fraternities and sororities, right? We're building community with black Americans. We're building these solidarities um, together. In the Northwest, we're kind of <laughs> far away from that, right? And don't kind of center that, but that's a, a critical part of uh, the black diasporic history. Um, Africa now, very clearly, right? These kind of efforts to this day, what y'all are doing in trying to think about how do we as people here in the diaspora support and build um, back home, I think is a part of this legacy. Um, this is a flyer in the middle for this joint celebration um, that celebrated Kwanzaa along with Ghana, which is uh, um, try to celebrate these two holidays together, right? And think about um, building community around this black diasporic holiday of Kwanzaa uh, and this East African religion um, coming from the Orthodox Church, right? Uh, that was not here. I think it was in the East Coast. Yeah, I'll, I'll, it's a little blurry here, but I can let you know. Um, uh, this guy right here, his name is Haile Garima. Um, he's a filmmaker. He was educated um, here in the U.S. He actually was part of the first group of black folks who were admitted to um, UCLA's film school. Uh, one of his most famous films is this, is this film called Sankofa. So uh, we mentioned Sankofa earlier, right? So Sankofa is, is a really beautiful film, right? So it's a story of a woman um, who goes to West Africa. She's a model and she's taking, um, uh, she's there for like a photo shoot, right? At the slave ca castles and kind of like beloved kindred, if folks have read those books, right? She's actually transported back in time um, and actually experiences enslavement herself, right? Um, so he's a guide to me because as an Ethiopian American to make a film about this very black American experience, right? Um, to think about enslavement as a part of his own legacy um, reflects I think what I think we should look to as like people, like role models, right? How do we engage with each other? How do we see our histories as shared? Uh, and even in, in places like film and culture, how we can express that, right? Um, he's actually come here before at Langston Hughes, I think a year or two ago. Uh, and did a, a, a talk uh, and discussion around one of his other films, Ashes and Embers, um, which is a film about like black Americans in the 1990s, issues around police brutality. He's done a lot of films around this too. Um, anyway, incredible figure. Again, his name is uh, Haile Garima. Um, he teaches at Howard University, a historically black college and university uh, in DC. He, that's where he teaches. Um, and he also has a, a bookstore, cafe, community space right across the street from the university called Sankofa. Uh, so if you ever go to D.C., like, go check, check it out. Uh, it's, a, it's a cool spot. Um, oh, and then I also want to plug this event that's coming up next week uh, on Saturday, March 9th. So it's a film screening of this film, Bound African versus African American. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, Isaiah Washington, the guy who had gotten citizenship in Senegal after doing the DNA testing. Um, so he actually funded this film. Uh, and along with the director, uh, are really trying to think about what are the ways in which our communities can come together and mobilize. Um, so I know a couple folks here are actually involved in that project. So um, I want to thank you all for letting me know. <laughs> and for, uh, I want to encourage everybody here, if you can, again, it's March 9th, so next Saturday, uh, at Langston Hughes Performing Arts Center at 4 p.m. So they're showing the documentary. Um, they're going to have a, a discussion after that, too. Okay. Um, so another great way to kind of continue this conversation. But I just want to connect this to, I think, one of the biggest political movements happening right now, which is Black Lives Matter, uh, and thinking about the intersection of our diaspora in this very um, important movement that I think we all kind of can associate and, and support, right? Um, so starting off with even just the founding of it, right, and the hashtag Black Lives Matter, uh, and the three women that came together to kind of mobilize around this, uh, Alicia Garza in the middle, Patrice Cullors on the left-hand side, and Opal Tometi on the right-hand side. Um, so Opal Tometi is actually a Nigerian-American, a Nigerian immigrant, uh, and she's also the, the co-founder and executive director of Black Alliance for Just Immigration, um, one of the organizations I mentioned earlier. Right? So being central to Black Lives Matter, identifying that Black Lives Matter is an issue that she and, and our broader African diaspora communities um, should also be engaged with. Um, so beyond the actual folks who are involved in it, 
Uh, one of the things that I don't think will come as a surprise to anybody here, right, is that um, the black diaspora as a whole have been targeted by police brutality, right? Um, we can think to historical examples of this. Amadou Diallo uh, in the 1990s, a uh, man from Guinea who was shot 40 times, uh, mostly in his back at, in, at his home where police thought he had a weapon. He was just reaching for his wallet to, to show them who he is um, and was a big kind of mobilization. Actually, a lot of um, in hip hop, Lauren Hill did some songs about him. There's actually a, a, an album called Hip Hop for Respect that was done as a fundraiser for his family where a lot of different artists came together um, to mobilize around that. Um, more local to us, uh, in Portland, there was an uh, Ethiopian student named Mulugeta Sarao who was actually killed by white supremacists uh, in Portland, right? A, a victim of white supremacy, a victim of this kind of uh, anti-blackness that we see being addressed in, in Black Lives Matter, um, but we also see affecting uh, this community, right? Uh, and then more recently, Alfred Olango, uh, who was from Uganda, he was shot and killed in Southern California, I think it was in San Diego. Um, a police officer mistook his pen as, as a gun, right? Um, just some real stupid, or as a, uh, not a pen, but an e-cigarette. Um, so in actually in this Black Lives Matter moment, uh, Alfred Alongo is one of the people named in that, in that effort, right? Um, so this is one of the things I always bring back to my community, right? Like this is our struggle as well. Like we need to be there. Um, we need to be present and show our faces and show our, show our effort. Um, and if we expand beyond the US globally, right? We see Black Lives Matter being used to speak on it practices of anti-blackness that manifest around the world, right? Um, so Ethiopian Jews in Israel who are being subjected to second class citizenship there use the banner of Black Lives Matter to talk about their struggle, right? Uh, in South Africa, um, in Amsterdam, uh, and then we see, I mean, the revival of the slave trade, right? We're seeing migrants in North Africa being enslaved, right? Um, we can think about, I mean, really some parallels that can be drawn. Bodies being migrating through the Mediterranean, right, on ships and dying, I mean, in many ways echoing the Middle Passage, right? Um, in African diaspora studies, one of the things that really like shook me um, when we were learning about the slave trade was they literally said like, sh you know, shark routes. The routes of sharks would change based on the direction of the transatlantic slave trade because of the number of African bodies who were being thrown overboard, right? that literally if we could see the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, we would see a trail of bones, right, of our ancestors, of, of, our, of our people, right? Uh, and right now we're seeing the same thing happening in the Mediterranean, right? Economic migrants um, and experiencing these kind of traumatic, really traumatic in North Africa and Egypt, being enslaved, being captured, being ransomed to their families, um, all for this kind of similar issue, right, of economic uh, migration part of a longer history of colonialism, uh, a theft of African resources, right? Again, why people are leaving is not because <laughs> they want to, right? People don't want to come here. They're, they're fleeing economic uh, or, or um, other forms of oppression back home, right? Um, so I want to encourage people to expand our thinking of Black Lives Matter um, beyond the US, right? Beyond issues of police brutality here. Um, a good friend of mine, Teju Adisa Farrar, wrote this article titled Black Solidarity Goes Both Ways, American Centricism, Centricism and transnational activism, uh, and she raises this question, right? Um, do we know the names of these figures who are being murdered by police, who are being murdered by similar practices of anti-blackness abroad, uh, in the same way that we center uh, the lives of American folks who are being uh, murdered in this regard too, right? Um, so making these connections, I think, is, is really critical. Um, okay, and then finally, I just want to leave you all with um, this poem uh, by one of my favorite poets, Naira Wahid, uh, and she writes, the diaspora is absolutely breathtaking, and the diaspora is in stunning pain. We are a great many things all at once, right? So how do we encompass the full range of the diaspora, the full range of both the struggle, the resilience, right, the pride, the cultures, uh, and then these ongoing aspects of um, inequality, right? And how do we mobilize here with people with a platform, with people with resources in support of that? Uh, and I think that's what we're all here to do, right? Um, so with that, I'm going to end <laughs> uh, my portion of this. Uh, so I want to thank you all for your, your time and attention.